Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the War Report. Now we're going to start with the good news this week, which is out of Syria. Is a, a bit of a contradiction that might sound like. Let me get the updated map here, because that's about two weeks out of date. And the big news out of Syria is that we have the offensive on Idlib finally happening. And you look at it, we're about a week out from summer ending, so it may very well be the last summer of Idlib, as we're looking at it right here. I mean, you have big You're moves right. all around. Putin and Assad have met in Moscow. It's about the first time in five years where he's actually went there. And, and again, I think the last time they met was just at the beginning of the Russian intervention in Syria. But it's mostly been meeting in third-party countries or meeting in Syria proper or Lavrov or Soigu going into Syria to meet with Assad or... Assad sending one of his ministers to Moscow. I mean, believe it or not, Netanyahu actually had been to Moscow more than Assad had, just to put things in perspective. And within the context of Syria, of course, but it is probably one of the most pivotal weeks we've seen out of Syria in probably the past, I would say, year. Because we had something similar this last year. It seems like Septem September is always that time they go in for the big moves in Syria as you're you can go back September 2018, September 2019, September of last year, and, of course, now September of this year. We're seeing that play out right now. We're seeing Russian, Syrian, and other aligned forces, pro-government militias, striking these groups in the greater Idlib area. You're seeing Iranian oil tankers make their way into Syria, helping relieve the oil and gas shortage. And... Of course, you do see some activity out of northeastern Syria. There was a woman who was killed by an unidentified suspect who was suspected to be tied to ISIS. There were fires caused by airstrikes on the Iraqi-Syrian border, actually, by, I believe it was Syrian jets striking opposition forces. You have these pockets of ISIS still within, again, the border along the Euphrates. And, of course, you have the pro-Turkish forces skirmishing with the Kurdish-backed forces. So, of course, the main news out of Syria, as always, is taking place in Idlib, in that northwestern corner of Syria. They have been all but abandoned by all of their former allies, even Turkey at this point. The United States, as we'll get into, is in so much of a late empire state that they could not care less about what is happening in Syria right now, seemingly. It is Amazing the direction that the Biden administration has really gone. The absolute nosedive of the American empire. And I'll, I'll, I'll say honestly, it's had its ups, it's had its downs. For us, at least. But that, that's certainly something interesting to watch play out, which we'll get into in a little bit here. And really just more or less the complete silence of what remaining quote-unquote coalition forces are still in Syria at this point. And it is a stark contrast. I know we just did our 20th anniversary of 9-11 episode. That if you told somebody on September 15th, 2001, that not only would we have boots on the ground in Syria, but we would have been completely rooted from Syria by Assad's son at that point. I, I believe he took power in either 2000 or 2001. Uh, again, like just trying to explain that much of a gap to somebody who's like, about to go to war with, like, Iraq and Afghanistan, a, a country in that mental state. And I do think, especially now that we've crossed that mark, a lot of our analysis, especially when it comes to the Middle East, will have to be looked at through that lens. Like, try imagining this on whatever date 20 years ago. Try imagining this in post-9-11-2001. And a lot of it is probably unfathomable for a lot of people who would be old enough to remember that. I'm sure you could probably attest that firsthand. But... Just the right. state of Syria after it's pretty much stagnated since the coronavirus crisis broke out. A lot of things slowed down in the world because of that. And so it's been about a year and a half, really, since about March 2020, before we really saw any major action out of Syria. Because late 2019 was probably the last time you saw any sort of magnitude of this kind of action in Syria. Yeah, and uh, and a lot has been going on. Uh, there are two towns on uh, on the verge of falling. Uh, they've been heavily bombarded. The, this is in the sort of uh, southwest, southeast pocket of um, 
Idlib, south of Idlib city, um, southwest of Aleppo. Uh, but the bombing has been nonstop for nearly two weeks now. And as you said, uh, the Syrian army is uh, preparing to go in. Uh, they have quelled the uprising in southern Syria, where the, revo the, the so-called revolution began. Uh, the last of the, uh, of, of the holdouts have given their weapons over. Um, the, the Russian military police are doing uh, patrols with the Syrian Arab army. And now that that's contained and we're seeing less ISIS attack in, in Vera and those areas in basically central and east central Syria, including those areas controlled by the Kurds. Um, although it's only so much that the Syrians can do in the Kurd held areas, though they are there. Um, I, I would say that uh, now they can focus on, on Idlib. And as you say, it looks like Erdogan is not really supporting them. Um, there have been at least five Turkish soldiers killed in the last week. These are not their proxies. These are not Arab proxies. These are not these that have Syria to fight. These are actually Turkish soldiers. And these are kind of firsts. And in the Turkish parliament, this has caused a bit of an uproar. People are, you know, want uh, something done about it. Uh, there are for and against. The, the voices for against being in Syria um, are rising. Uh, I do wonder how much of this maybe plays into, let's say, Bolton and Company's uh, hands, because uh, you know they've they've created a new think tank, basically devoted to ousting Erdogan. Uh, in any case, he's not doing much, and it does look like if if ever there was a time for a push into that region uh, to oust the last stronghold, real stronghold, it's that area. Because now all the big, like all the other strong strongholds are nation states or within words, the areas that the Kurds control with the backing of the U.S., the U.S. Uh, controlled areas of Syria, uh, and of course, the, you know, the Syrian and Russian held areas of Syria. Uh, other than that, what you're really just talking about is ISIS and some Al-Qaeda affiliated groups and HTS, uh, Harat al-Sham. So if, uh, if HTS is ousted out of Idlib, uh, it's essentially over for Idlib. Last two and a half, maybe almost three years, HTS has worked very hard, not just rebranding itself, uh, particularly for British media, but for uh, control of that region. And it's gone, it, it, it's, it's had skirmishes, and it's, there's a significant death toll just to make sure that everybody in Idlib knows that HTS runs the show. It looks like that might not be the case uh, for very much longer. Oh, certainly not. And again, I don't see how it actually would maintain itself there if that is the case. And really, I am feeling a bit vindicated right now with this whole last summer of Idlib thing that... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, the, it was the perfect time for it to fall. This year, the particularly the middle of this year, was the perfect time for the last downfall of Idlib, for Syrian forces to finally move in and put an end to this because, like like I said and like you said, at what point is anything stopping them? Uh, is Turkey stopping them? Is the US stopping them? Is UK, France, uh, Israel has even ceased the level of strikes it had up until about late 2019, it looks like the support of Russia and Iran is not going anywhere anytime soon. Saudi Arabia has backed off. Of course, they've been trying to court them back into the Arab League over the past year. And really, there is just nobody standing in their way in order to do this. And 
maybe this is a bit aspirational, but may, maybe Assad's every inch comment will come to pass one of these days, because I would have thought that at some point they would have had to make some sort of political concession in the Idlib, have to deal with this diplomatically somehow, but it looks like they're just going to march in and put an end to this. Now, I don't know what the internal conditions inside rebel-held Idlib are, if it is to the point where maybe the civilians on the ground would just have no loyalty to the current authorities, the current rebel authorities, and wouldn't stand by them or would defect if Syrian forces moved in. From what I know, it's much lower than, again, government-controlled Syria, and there's very little loyalty left in the Idlib province and in northwestern Syria in general. As you'll recall, a lot of these groups started yeah. infighting with each other around this time two years ago, around maybe, again, just shy two years ago, like late November 2019, around then, where a lot of the groups who were both being funded by Turkey at the time, or all of them were being funded by, most of them being funded by Turkey at the time, I should say, were starting to fight against each other as Syrian forces closed in. And that's been a semi-frequent occurrence whenever Syrian forces close in. I don't know the state of it on the ground now, but it seems like they're not being met with very heavy resistance. Now, of course, that's not to say no resistance, but it's not exactly a meat grinder for the Syrian forces marching in there, which I think was the big concern. I, as I always go back to, nobody wanted to fire that first shot. Nobody wanted to be responsible for that bloodbath. But it looks like casualty numbers thus far are pretty low on both sides, all things considered, especially what you consider from a place like Idlib. So I guess now was just the perfect opportunity to strike. I'm sure the Russian advisors were telling Assad to hold off, the Iranian advisors were telling Assad to hold off, and it, I mean, it had to be a coordinated effort between the three in order for something, and again, we're still early in it, something could go wrong, I'm not pretending like this has been a stunning success so far, but just the early amounts of success we've seen, there had to be some greater coordination, at least I think, in order to pull something like this off. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's kind of heartwarming to see because it could very well mean the end of the the war. Um, I'm I'm always going to be skeptical because I think the possibility for creating new insurgents and a new round of destabilization in Syria is uh, is very likely, uh, and and. Uh, you know, there very well may be a policy of, of let's say, not a policy, but there, it, it could be geopolitically that Russia finds itself in another situation where it will have to leave Syria. Uh, although that doesn't look like the case right now. Uh, Russia doesn't have the kind of footprint in Syria, let's say, that America had in Afghanistan at any point or in Iraq, and again, at any point. Also, um, there isn't a, a factionalist fighting within uh, Syria. I mean, there is, and, it, and that's a major feature of the war, but I'm saying there is no factional fighting within the government apparatus, right? So, and uh, Assad is the president, uh, and there isn't somebody else, and um, not until things is will there be a kind of possibility of uh, anyone else having a chance. And there's just too many areas within uh, Syria, particularly in Damascus and Aleppo, so really for through, um, these areas are very much back to normal. Uh, the entire western section of the country along the Mediterranean is secure, and in fact, it's so, as you, as you mentioned earlier, briefly, Iranian ships are delivering much diesel fuel uh, for not just, of course, uh, the Americans are occupying that oil and stealing it and giving it to the Iraqis, but, at the, uh, but they're going to use this supply, and as many, many, many ships are coming in of diesel fuel that will go to Lebanon. Um, they're going to be delivered by truck, and this is a way that Iran can avoid sanctions. 
uh, by doing this. And it's, this, I think, in and of itself, is a, an extremely interesting development because I think wh whatever you think of the blast last year in the harbor, uh, August 2020, in Beirut, which killed, I believe, around, I think, 175 to 200 people. Uh, it looked like it was going to do far more than that. But in any case, um, people have speculated, because there is an economic crisis and there's a political crisis, that this would be the event that would pry Hezbollah from support amongst the Lebanese and even the Lebanese um, political class and the Lebanese, and maybe even more important, the Lebanese um, military. They do, Hezbollah does in, enjoy some support there. So I would say that that's not going to happen. Uh, there was a channel last year that um, and almost, you know, barely contained uh, gleeful uh, <laughs> words was saying that, uh, you know, Hezbollah's days are numbered and I run. Good luck. <laughs> Remember how Macron <laughs> was supposed to happen. broker the ultimate coalition that would finally bring yeah. peace and stability to <laughs> Lebanon <laughs> and then gave up yeah. after three weeks? Yeah, that's not going to happen. Um Hezbollah in, uh, in, uh, in, in Lebanon is absolutely legit. And um, they can always, um, you know, use the narrative that the West is seeking to destabilize Lebanon and so on and so on. And, uh, you know, and it's the West that's the, you know, they're the bad guys in this. Um, so they're quite capable of doing something like that. And, and they'll gain uh, support and popularity for it. In any case, um, so that gives you an idea of the kind of slow success that's been developing in um, in Syria and in the countries around it. Oh, certainly. And I think what we do see out of there, and as you mentioned, the possibility for another insurgency or another incident in Syria to put the country back in the stagnate state it's been in, is how unhinged the American empire has been as an institution lately. That's not even talking about a particular empire, a particular component of the empire or particular politician or Biden administration, Trump administration. No, none of that. I mean, I'm talking about systemic issues within the American empire at this point. Mm. And what we see right here now with the recent announcements from Biden, particularly in regards to uh, a certain medical procedure, a certain medical treatment, as we'll put it, and in terms <laughs> of uh, cracking down on January 6th and uh, e extremism and terrorism in the country and new security state measures, I, w I wouldn't say that they are in a genuine panic. I still think they are trying to drum up something, again, to justify the Empire's existence. Again, another boogeyman, something to increase their reason to seize power. But I do think this is probably the most genuinely panicked this past year since Biden has taken office than they've been in quite some time. And think what you will about like the QAnon stuff, as much as nonsense I think that is. I think the fact that just an idea, a movement, the fact that's... I mean, because QAnon, again, a lot of it is like, trust the plan, like, uh, Trump will save us all in the end, blah, 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 again, sort of building this messianic cult around Trump. I don't believe in any of that, don't get me wrong. But I think the idea that such a group has millions of followers saying, you know what, the establishment is against us, we can't trust it, and these people are against us, not only are they just political opponents, not only do we just disagree with them on taxes or, uh, again, some social issue, no, these people actively despise us and want us under again, under their rule. And I think just the freaking out about that and other, like, Trump-related ideologies is really playing into this idea of they need something to solidify the regime. They need something to crack down. And, of course, they're trying to create a normal, sane majority against a radical minority, whether those be people who are just skeptical of said medical treatment or if they think the election may have not been entirely honest, or a number of things. 
or if they participate in a certain protest at the beginning of the year in the capital of the United States. They are really trying to gin this up, and they've been cycling through all these narratives. Again, a lot of people are focusing a lot on Biden's mandates to OSHA and like uh, trying to coerce workplaces into enforcing these mandates. Again, trying to do it in a third-party sort of way. But another one I think a lot of people missed is that they want, of course, various agencies to start monitoring any bank account, whether that be checking, savings, investment account that has more than $600 balance in it. So it's just these very – wow, like you, you think of like Russia and China, these authoritarian states, how horrible. But in a way, they're less repressive than that because – it's pretty straightforward. You know the regime, you know who's in charge, you know the rules, you know the do's and don'ts. But at this point, you have this empire that needs to keep up this facade of being the freest country in the world, blah, 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 blah. But it needs to just aggressively crack down on these elements. And again, I'm not saying it's because like we're on the verge of 1776 2.0, but I think that they realize enough people have lost confidence in the regime, not even to the point where, again, sort of going back to the apathy thing, where enough people are apathetic, enough people are becoming disengaged enough that they need something to reel them back in. And I do think the main push of the medical, experimental medical treatment, as we call it, despite the fact it's been approved by the FDA at this point, is not only about that, not only about, again, the idea of control, but it's the idea of putting it as if they're the only hope. We're up against this deadly disease, and we're the only people who have the solution to rectify that. Even though you look into that solution, it is dubious at best. I'm not here to fearmonger. I'm not here to tell you to do it one way or another. Frankly, make your own decisions. And I mean, if if you decide you want to go get that put in you, like, I guess that's your problem. Best of luck to you. Hopefully, you're like the vast majority of people have no side effects. But you get into some demographics, and again, to just to skirt around the words. At some point, it's just more of a risk than actually dealing with the illness itself. And that's particularly for young people, particularly young men. Makes you think, doesn't it? Uh, And again, just the absolute level of ineffectiveness. It becomes... I mean, this feels like something like that would have been even absurd in the late Soviet Union. This would have even been absurd like in like 1985 Soviet Union. Right. Well, I would I would say one of the things that they are doing that was kind of done in the Soviet Union is to is to um, make ridiculous claims uh, and and see if people obediently, um, uh, you know, applaud, absorb and applaud those claims like. A very interesting thing that happened with this recent Biden speech where he 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 showcased his new covid mandates uh you know amongst things like any company with a hundred or more uh workers have to have a covid mandate and you know various uh, arms that the government will have to you know the military particularly will have to have a covid mandate but interestingly well, it, I, the, I will also the interject post, because the post I've, office will not I, I yes the post office will not and look at the demographics of who works there and look at the demographics of who are not getting this treatment it's not the crazy white rednecks i'm not saying the crazy white rednecks are but they're certainly not the ones making up the uh resistance to it so to speak and it is also funny because as an alternative to this they also say well you know as a substitute you can do weekly testings and I mean, with that, it's like, yeah, at, at that there point, is, it's just has, like, it's like a, a, it's like a clan clown show. Like, oh, you know, you got to prove this every week, blah, 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 blah. And again, the guidelines aren't fully set out for that. That's up to OSHA, which who knows how long they could take to do that. And who knows how much reneging. And again, while there is reason to be concerned, I will say that much. I think it's too early to really make a definitive statement on because of how much of a bureaucratic nightmare this is going to be even to implement in the first place. Right. I mean, I, I've even seen people boasting uh, when I lurk on Twitter uh, that, you know, I fired three people to bring my total of uh, employees down to, uh, at 99. Uh, you know, basically saying, like, if I have to do that, then that's what I'm going to do. So, uh, uh, but the the point I wanted to make was, um, th- there is a complete lack of confidence uh, in in leadership in America right now, and 
you know, Biden's demands are not making sense. And as you pointed out, this is why I wanted to bring it up. You pointed out that for men, it's particularly for young men and for teenage boys, uh, these shots are proving to be far more harmful. So there's been more deaths and um, cases of severe illnesses, lifelong sometimes, uh, illnesses from taking the COVID shot. Uh, then actually from coronavirus itself. And like I said, we're not even here to fear monger or push an agenda. It's just that like, okay, it's rare enough of a chance to get it already. And while it may be rare to get that, you're just ended up, you're just ending up taking more of a chance in regard to that. Like I said, if you, by all means, I, you know, most of my audience is within that demographically significant chunk. If you want to go ahead and do that because you feel compelled to or coerced to by a, a job or a school, like, I, I guess you just got to live your life the way you are, but just talking about it in a broad sense, it is ridiculous. And it is funny because you see supposed internal leaks from a lot of these agencies and even these companies where they're saying like, well, there's no way in hell we can enforce this if enough, like if the amount of people holding out now continue to hold out, there's no way in hell we can enforce this. We would be, we would collapse under our own weight. So Again, not only do we have right. that, we have the uh, what I think is a far more overlooked angle, the impending bureaucratic and corporate nightmare of even trying to get this in the place in the first place. And it's going to be something, and I think that's I think that's part of the plan, that they want it to be a lingering threat, something they always had the capability of doing, but you never know when they're going to do it. Again, something they can just just dangle over you for as long as they want. Right. And one of the things that is uh, actually stopping people from either the second shot or any shot whatsoever is the creeping news emanating out of places like Israel, Iceland, Gibraltar, where the population is well, well over 70 percent double vaccinated and the amount of new cases and COVID deaths are increasing Amongst the vaccinated, for instance, uh, in Britain, there was uh, sorry, in Scotland, uh, they're showing some signs that people who are vaccinated now are more likely to be hospitalized from COVID, even die from it. Uh, there was uh, on, I, I don't know if it was Sky, like their British um, syndicate, like uh, Sky News in Britain rather than Sky Australia, because you know, I don't know if people skies in Australia. In, in any case, they had a um, uh, a panel, and I, I I believe the one of the men on the panel on, on the left side was like promoting the vaccine. He, he was uh, I don't know whether he was a representative from healthcare, uh, but the other people on the panel were really shocked. They said, you know. We have doubled the amount of people with COVID, and we've got nearly 70% of the country double vaxxed. What is going on? And you can't explain this, that people who've had COVID before are COVID again. There's been several studies that have already come out showing people who have had COVID are, have, are much more resilient and are, and, you know, are not getting it again with uh you know, the severe out, uh, effects afterwards or are having it again at all. So people are becoming more and more hesitant. And, we, you know, we see, just to put it in context, we see really um, a lack of leadership in a government that people post 9-11 just cannot trust anymore. Uh, and of course, those that trust it, they only trust, you know, one side. Uh, and, we, we, you know, Whatever, no matter how hypocritical it is, they'll embrace it because they're interested in their side winning. And the reason for this is because the direction of the country is completely uncertain. The The future and where the goes at this point looks very uncertain. People instinctually do these kinds of things when they're in that kind of environment. It's, yes, it's the division of which direction to go, but we're still talking about the future here and uh, yeah so you know covid is uh it's unraveling a lot of countries you've seen the u-turn that the, the the uk has done where 
you know, Boris Johnson initially said that they're not going to do a green pass, a COVID pass. And then the next day it was switched. One of his ministers said they would. And then it got reversed again, uh, but said it would be on the table if need be. Uh, Denmark, of course, has dropped all their, um, uh, they've reached 70%. And, you know, they don't care anymore at this point. And it should be noted that, like, uh, you know, I was at Worldometer looking at the statistics uh, that are officially released by the government of you know, these countries, and they include and the rate of deaths per 100,000 plus a total of like the population and graphs so that you easily can understand where the waves are. Um, when you look at that, like, uh, Britain has had slightly more deaths per 100,000, even though it's a smaller population, than America. And Russia's are like less than half. People go on and on about, or they used to go on and on about Russia. Russia's doing, in comparison to these other countries, just fine. And there's like no lockdowns. Uh, less than 30% of Russians are double vaxxed. Extremely skeptical. You're seeing Romania where... Yes, infection and deaths are higher, but extremely skeptical. Again, only 30% of the population is fully vaxxed. And we're, we're just seeing too many of these reports where people uh, who are getting COVID are getting it twice because they're vaxxed, because uh, their immune system is, is being depleted. Now, I'm willing to guess that these are, you know, most likely older people. Um, there's probably exceptions to that too, but that is the case. Uh, you read the reports coming out of Israel, most of the people, well over half the people, just like in Britain, just like in Iceland, well over half the people are already vaxxed that are in hospital. And that just does not make sense, right? So we're seeing the efficacy of the lack of the efficacy of the, of the vaccines being demonstrated, and they're pushing even harder for people to get vaccinated. It doesn't make sense. And that's why Biden's statement about, um, you know, we're running out of patience and um, this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. It's baloney. Uh, and, and he gives it away when he says, um, uh, he suggests that the unvaccinated are, are endangering everybody. W well, how? You're vaccinated. That's impossible. Like, e either say the obvious that the vaccines aren't working and that we're going to probably be stuck with COVID for some time, which is something I was saying last year, and you're just going to have to live with it, or, like, stop lying. Yeah, it's really, and again, it's this late empire attitude. It's this thing that you really only get out of these countries that are... While functionally they may be keeping their head above the water wall, state institutions may be doing their job to the point where things aren't falling apart, not to defend the efficiency of American bureaucracy or anything, I would never go that far, but it's the move of a regime that knows there is trouble on the horizon, that knows something, that knows their one real crisis away from complete disaster. So, of course, if they can foment the foment and ha put their own quote-unquote solutions on these smaller crises, they can gain legitimacy among their population. They can, again, gain prestige on the world stage, perhaps. But it seems like every time those backfire. And I wouldn't even say that mm -hmm. would be something that they planned out, like, oh, we're going to fail on purpose. I do think it's where incompetence meets malice. There's malice in them plotting these things, and then there's incompetence yeah. in their execution, which is really the worst of both worlds, if you think about it. And speaking of incompetence and malice, we have some big news out of the uh, Chiefs of Staff, Donald Trump, and the last yeah, days of his administration. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the infamous General Mark Milley at this point. And when he's not busy complaining about white rage or right-wing extremists or any of these sort of things or January 6th, it turns out he's making backdeal doors with the Chinese and taking away the president's uh, duly elected authority. Now, again, I'm no defender of... Well, well I should clarify. 
at this point, I think the Constitution has meant nothing for at least a century, if not before. And frankly, if we're being honest, the Constitution hasn't held any real sway in this country since 1861. And that's not even like a defense of the South succession. That's not, again, I'm saying that just as an objective statement. The constitutional regime, and again, you can hear, you can listen to people like Moldbug say this. Well, yeah, like the American Second Republic died that day, like during the Civil War. And of course, we've been replaced with subsequent regimes, New Deal regime, etc. Um, great society, and who knows what? I mean, I think we're probably like on our fifth or sixth regime change at this point. If we're going by like the way the French would number their systems, but that's all aside the point. But you have a general, somebody who's supposed to be a subordinate of the chief of state at that point, which. You know, I, I am a big believer in principle in autocracy and a strong executive, so um, whether or not I like them now, of course, I will be practical when it comes to applying these principles. It does rub me the wrong way to have a subordinate treat their higher-up like that, especially when that higher-up is supposed to be in charge of the entire nation, theoretically, and pretty much saying, mm-hmm. well, we're going to take the launch codes away from you, we're not going to approve this nuclear strike, but, again, like, in, even just moving beyond nukes, like, of course, because that's the most extreme example you can think of, these world-ending devices. But that trickles down into more mundane things, even to the point where it just gets to everyday governance. And, again, not that I even will be damned to defend Donald Trump at this point. I think that, uh, love him or hate him, that ship has sailed. I don't see him running again. I think he's more or less irrelevant in American politics beyond the mythology he was I would say actually, actually an unwitting partaker of, at least in my opinion. But again, that's that's yeah. aside the point. But you have somebody who's supposed to be in charge of the military, supposed to be, again, the chief military advisor of the president, up there with people like the uh, Secretary of Defense. And he's outright rebuking his orders because ma- election, whatever. And uh, we were afraid he was going to take rash action against Iran or China because he was about to lose the election and, or about to be removed from office and his appeal didn't work. So, I mean, it, it was an absurd notion from the start, the idea that at that point, even if he wanted to, that dropping a nuke on Tehran or Beijing would actually... <laughs> what, would it, what would it do? Yeah, what, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't change... So the story is so preposterous. It reminds me of that time when they said that um, that he went to a, a World War One grave site and looked at the fallen soldiers that fought it. Yeah, obviously fake. That was. I mean, I mean it's 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 fake. It's even more fake than the whole Russian being on him stuff. None of this stuff ever materialized. There was never any evidence for it. It was everybody knew, knows that he died every day for over four years of like you know making up stuff about Trump, making stuff up about uh, say uh, General Flynn. So you know they made up stuff uh, stuff up about Flynn. Did they turn treason? No. Because there was no treasonous remarks. The readout from his phone conversation with uh, the, the, the Russian politician that he spoke to was completely normal. That is what's supposed to happen. He is incoming. He is part of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, there, there was nothing untoward. What, what, what he did was completely legitimate and normal. And they wanted to make you believe that they were plotting the, I mean, they always wanted to make you believe that they were plotting the overthrow of America or, or some other kind of nonsense. And so Flynn lost. I, I mean, everything. if anything, now, and I'm not even saying, I'm not even going to go this far. If Flynn threw America under the bus for anybody in those conversations, it was for Israel, like in terms of plotting his strategy, yeah. like geopolitically, like. I'm not saying like he was like full on Zionist the same way somebody like a John Bolton would be, but it was still again if we're going to point that figure at anyone if he was colluding with anyone it, it was Israel but that's aside the point. Right, right, right. I mean nobody gets in trouble for doing that in in America anymore, anyways. So, um, the 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 thing with Flynn is, and the thing with Millie and what he's done is. 
you 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 now have like X-ray vision into what is the deep state, who does really uh, run America, right? Um, what is allowed or not allowed? What is the policy of the permanent state of America? Because Milley reaches out to the head of the CIA and he reaches out to Nancy Pelosi. I mean, besides the the, the his Chinese counterpart. Uh, assuring him that there was not going to be a new, as if there was ever going to be a nuclear war. It's preposterous. But um, the, the whole, that whole, ex- that, that whole thing that ju- that just, you know, was revealed in Woodward's and, and Costa's new book, Herald, uh, that's where all this information is coming from, for, for the listeners who don't know. Uh, all of that stuff basically tells you who's in charge, right? So Pelosi is kind of like, the, the shadow president, um, the CIA is really the intelligence that, that's running the show. Well, I mean, you could argue that's true with every president. But um, and Milley considers himself at this time with uh, considering he's there with uh, you know part of the same administration as the outgoing president is. Well, I'm the legitimate president, actually. <laughs> you know, you're going to swear allegiance to me. This is what we're going to do. The, the the story is so preposterous. I can only think that he was either fed stories about Trump that were so absurd, but he believed them anyways, uh, that he decided to do this. Uh, there's no question that this could have been something that would have been concealed. The reason we know this is because Trump's admin had no idea about it until the book got published. Right. So if they wanted to keep this thing quiet, they could have. So what's the point? Well, besides just a flex uh, on Trump, besides promulgating the idea that Trump was working in collusion with Putin to overthrow America and America's only, you know, you know, maybe China can save America or maybe the rad libs of America like Millie can can save America. Um I, I would say there's another possibility want and him out. I know when you read the Washington Post article and, and some of the stuff CNN has been publishing and MSNBC, most are with uh, Millie. They're, they're, they're calling him a hero. However, there's another character, Vindman. Uh, remember Vindman in uh, late 2017? About two years ago today, uh, when there were the oh, second you mean the, the hero of Ukraine, Trump, the hero of Ukraine, a real American Ukrainian hero, uh, Vindman, uh, um, has asked Millie, has, has basically said on his Twitter that he should resign, that this broke pro- protocol and there's no excuse for it. So that's interesting that Vindman would say that. And that's what makes me think, like, maybe there are some people who want him out. Um, or the problem with that theory, I'm not saying it's not true, and I'm not saying I, 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 I haven't really invested in one or the my problem with that theory is um, Millie should have resigned by now anyways, because it's out, right? And Woodward is, you know, everybody knows him from, you know, back uh, with Watergate, but he has become this kind of of uh, historian or, or the, you know, repository of of uh, of the of, you know American history and its government, and he's authoritative, right? Like, it, if if Woodward publishes it. It's, you know, it's safe to say that there is a deep kind of cooperation, collusion, if you want. This, this is a deep cooperation between him as a, a journalist and a media figure and the American super state, the perma government, the, the. Right. He really hasn't resigned and he, he was protecting him. But, Conference uh, uh, escape this afternoon. Then I'm kind of he's not going to win for Trump, and they can't afford that. 
they cannot afford what like it, it's like this with Afghanistan and, and Bagram Air Force Base. Uh, it was good to see Rand Paul uh, criticize Blinken because that's obviously if they had Bagram, virtually everything horrible that that happened uh, at Kabul Airport would not have happened, and that's obvious now. Uh, in any case, um, none of these people can go because if they do, then that the, then that's a win for for the Trump crowd, and they can't risk them. that. That's how antagonistic and divided things are. Really. Oh, absolutely! It he cannot go under any circumstance, which makes me think that this was a legitimate leak and not something just to throw him under the bus because if yeah. they, they wanted to do that, they could have gotten rid of him in a much more quiet way at a much more convenient time. But at the point where they could have threatened him, they could have said, you know, you're in this book. Uh, what are you going to do? I mean, he knows he's going to be in the book. He doesn't care. Sorry. And I do have to just say, going back to this entire past year, I would say really starting with the um, the, the quote-unquote revolution, the cultural revolution America underwent starting in May of 2020, that I think the image of the military, particularly among American right-wingers, and this is by no means a new or fresh take, but I think this just piles all a lot more onto it, has, the, the illusion has been shattered because... Before then, especially yeah. in in times of like national crisis or uh, times of war, such as again the, the aftermath nine eleven, or even going back into the sixties into Vietnam, the military was thought of as this very like right wing all American organization. You have all these boys from you know the rural South and the Midwest signing up to go fight for Uncle Sam, which that's only part of the truth. I mean, those are the those are the, those are the people who are actually on the ground fighting the wars, but I don't think I, a lot of people realized until recently that the officer class, since the Cold War and especially post Cold War, it's it's a political position. I mean, it's always been a political position when you get up into that high ranking things, no matter what country, civilization, time period we're talking about. Anyone who's in charge of commanding entire armies, entire navies, whatever is going to have to have direct links to the head of state. Historically, the head of state served in those roles. I mean, it was up until World War One where you had European aristocracy charging over the trenches with their men, or at least serving in the role of some sort of field commander, at least in the position, maybe not in the direct fighting, where they're still at risk of dying in this war that they helped perpetuate, which, again, I think that helps create some accountability, just, just, just some editorializing here. The fact that, again, when in World War One, when... One of the field commanders is, you know, the son of, of the Kaiser. I think that helps, you know, put these wars in perspective for the ruling class. It, it actually makes it mm. mean something to them where, versus these perpetual wars. And, of course, uh, one could say that that would be a reason for universal conscription. But, I mean, look no further than Vietnam to look at how easy it is to get out of the draft, especially if you know the right people and have the right connections. But, again, that's all aside the point. But while you had... at it, on its surface, the people actually going and fighting these wars and enlisting are these salt-of-the-earth Americans. These generals, these officers, mm -hmm. the people who staff the Pentagon are coming out of what are fundamentally universities. Even these military academies are, I mean, culturally, I mean, look at that one uh, West Point graduation photo with, of course, all these strong black women or the one with, like, the, the, the commie LARPer guy holding his fist up with uh, his, like, hat and everything. Again, like, it, it fundamentally, it's no different than the sort of culture that you get on college campuses. It, they're not military schools. They're schools that pretend to be military schools, if you will. And those are the people... Now, of course, as I said, it's accelerated since the 90s, since the Soviet Union fell, because our risk of fighting a major war dropped off exponentially since then. But even, I would say, like, again, from especially World War II onwards, where you have these explicitly political officers. We have these explicit people who are meant to be politicians, and a lot of them want to be politicians. It's really the best way they can rank up. I mean, you saw this with Mattis as well, Trump's former defense secretary. He wanted so desperately yeah. to be secretary of state back when he was in the administration because he'd go everywhere with like people like Bolton or um, Pompeo or 
Uh, Tillerson. I almost forgot Rex Tillerson existed. Yeah, yeah, what a lost opportunity. I, you know, say what you will about the guy, but I think he would have made a far superior Secretary of State than Mike Pompeo. But that's, again, I'm going off on a tangent here. But you have this desire of these people who want the force of the military quite literally behind them and the prestige of being a colonel or a general or an admiral or any of these high-ranking prestigious things, even if many of them have, you know, hardly seen combat. Now, Millie actually is an exception to that. I believe he does actually have combat experience. But you'll get these career bureaucrats in military uniforms, and those are the people in charge of it. But the overarching point is, I think that woke a lot of conservatives up to the idea that fundamentally that's what our military functionally is. Sure, you may have all these people who are, you know, normal people, even good people, actually doing the legwork in it, but what does that matter when the people giving them marching orders are these clowns? And, I mean, this has even got to the point, think what you will about Fox News, think what you will about Tucker Carlson. I'm, there's plenty of legitimate criticisms. Controlled opposition, maybe. But in terms of the fact that they even have to deploy this sort of rhetoric in the mainstream media, that you'll get a Fox News host, the primetime prime time Fox News co- host mocking, like, the top brass in the military, unthinkable in 2001, unthinkable in 2003, unthinkable in 2016 or 2017. It's really a product of this result. And I do think that the establishment right even has realized they've even lost their outer party position, their junior party in the re- position in the regime, or are starting to lose to the point where they're more willing to be transgressive like this. I'm not saying they're on our side or anything, but like when you get... Yeah like mainstream Republican pundits and politicians mocking the top brass in the military or criticizing them when back, you know, back in the day, it was completely sacrosanct. Like not even legitimate criticism could be met without being, being called your anti-American. You hate this country. You want the terrorist or the communist to win or whatever. But I do think that this rhetoric at least is being allowed to be employed because things have fallen so far. Like I said, even for the establishment conservatives, even for the establishment right wingers, that they've lost their position as the junior party, as the outer party. And, I mean, functionally, we're in a one-party state because any, quote-unquote, Republican opposition or whatever is either loyal or fangless. And <laughs> I, I think just going back, overarching, from 2020 onward, that is the perspective that we have to see the American empire through. And really, based on the structure of the American empire, one thing that, when you eliminate all your rivals, at least effectively, you've won the day. Of course, when the communists became the sole party in China that could hold power, you think they'd won the day. But based on the mythology that the American system has given us, and based on everything else, I would say the fact that they had to push out the, even that puppet opposition party, or turn them even, to even more of a puppet than before, is actually a sign of weakness from the way we have things set up. Uh, I saw Joaquin Phoenix, uh, sorry, Joaquin Flor. Yeah, so uh, so Flor is, uh, was asked, you know, w- w- when did he think that the, the, the beginning of the end of the American Empire? began and you know he says something pretty interesting the but he thought it was in the 90s i don't however think in the 90s he thought that but but it's a conclusion that maybe it is going be sometime in the 2000s that uh essentially uh you know the what he and PNAC um, that both those publications uh, had the new, uh, you know, Richard Pearl, Wolfowitz, uh, Kagan was was part of that group as well. Um, was you didn't succeed in um, to, to finish this off and then you know, I, I, after the 90s, where the you know the Americans could not set up bases in Central um, 
he should care about it. But let's cut to get going in 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 all the and succeeded so well in Afghanistan. They they were and that but that never materialized and and you know even go In 2005. And so the idea is let's say that, you know, you've, you've, he didn't say this, but I'll, I'll have a, you know, I'll use an analogy. Uh, let, let's say you have this um, apple tree that's going to be cut down, right? And it's, it's imminent. I mean, you shake that apple tree really hard and you get as many apples to fall down as possible because it's, it's, it's not going to be up anyways. It's not going to. It's not going to stay there. There's no. There isn't going to be any fruit next year, and so that's what you do. And so the idea was that, in many ways, these wars were fought to extract as much wealth out of um, essentially taxpayers and, and uh, to keep the whole money circulating, money, you know, money machine go burr process going. Um, and of course, you know, geopolitically, they they were causing trouble. They were suspending development in that area for for quite some time uh, you know where is it going to go now for instance uh when the afghani government was in charge you know america you know gave iran the the go-ahead that they could sell their oil to 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 um to afghanistan now you know i don't know if that's still going on now i don't know what the conditions are but that gives you an idea of how they wanted to position themselves but um yeah i don't i don't want to go off on a uh, on, on a tangent but there is this idea that um maybe the lack of leadership we're seeing is because of this process of trying to extract you know as much juice out of this thing as possible and you know see you know wherever it falls it falls because a lot of people are i mean uh, people who can people who are wealthy um are kind of making plans for you know weathering this out and i think they can they have more than one home and so on and perhaps they'll make like the uh, russian oligarchs perhaps they have a uh, various locations various backup plans maybe some of those being in tel aviv but that's aside the point but <laughs> we we have touched on this point since the beginning of march 2020 when we thought things were going to be really bad when we thought this was going to be cataclysmic. Now, it was cataclysmic, admittedly, but not in the way I thought it was going to be. It took quite a different direction, but I, I mean, I guess we were 25% right, which is better than nothing. Mm. But I, I was saying, we're going to reach a point at the crossroads where the American elite are going to look at this behemoth they created, going to look at this unsustainable beast that they've created, and they're going to have to make a quick calculation in their head. Is it more worth it to keep this thing on life support, to keep it moving on, just barely, just can, just barely dragging itself along yeah. or do we plunder this thing for all it's worth do we take it to the scrapyard and get whatever we can for it and move on to our next project and i think slowly but surely you're seeing option b being implemented where there is much less concern not that there was ever much concern among these people for the long-term prospects of the american empire most of them don't have a vision for 20 to 50 years in the vision, uh, 20 to 50 years in the future, let alone 5 to 10. And of course, with democratic cycles, you have elections every two, four, and six years, depending on the office we're talking about, whether that's congressman, president, or senate. So there's not really an incentive to think that far beyond really more than a decade at most, and that's even being generous. And it yeah. looks like that time horizon has gotten even, again, that window of time has gotten even smaller where it doesn't seem like they're even thinking a year into the future how many of them when this first broke out when they first saw the abundant opportunity to re-entrench the regime after and because admittedly and you can go back and listen to our year in review maybe it's my disgusting optimism speaking 2019 2018 2019 were horrible years for liberalism on a global scale and of course, you had the Freedom House getting out there and complaining about these countries are less democratic than ever. We have to crack down on Hungary. We have to crack down on Poland. Russia is this threat. Look at the rise of China. 
they were shaking in their boots quite literally. I don't say like sarcastically at all. That these yeah. that the the liberal West have, after the mild successes or at least just the presence of Trump, the gaining of round of right wing populist parties in Europe. Again, think what you will about them. They're more symbolic than actually effective. It, it was it was a horrible year. So. How much of this crisis starting in early 2020 was manufactured quite literally in a lab, or how much of it just naturally occurred, or however much pre-planning they put into this, it, it was their golden opportunity. And my naive self in February 2020, you can go back and listen to our old episode saying, I think this finally might be the death knell of liberalism. I think that our neoliberal elites aren't going to take this pretty scary thing seriously, and that's going to be their downfall. Well, it turns out they pulled like the reverse card in Uno on me because they took it overly seriously, hence legitimizing themselves to enough of the population to bolster their support in the regime. But again, it's a very fleeting support. This is a very fleeting thing, especially now that they're right. not fighting from the opposition. Because you could argue, and you see this, I think, a lot in democratic systems where getting in power has gotten them a, a bit complacent. Not that they were ever, quote unquote, out of power, but functioning as the public at least in the public consciousness, the quote-unquote opposition party throughout 2020, I think, played much better, I think did much better things for them. And the Republicans have been grossly weak on playing the role of the opposition party in this year, which, I mean, sort of be expected, but I do think complacency could play into this, but I also do think, just getting back to the point where now that they've got extreme loyalists to the cause, so to speak, in power, people such as Biden, people such as Kamala, now is the time to commence plundering and looting the system and taking it to the scrapyard for all it's worth because they finally got there. And what better cover do you have than the 70-year-old man who is coherent one day and can hardly form a sentence the next? Like, Donald Trump was a buffoonish clown enough on his own but that's, that's the thing. He was too much a wild card. While he ultimately, in the end, always capitulated, he always kicked and screamed his way to capitulation. Now, he didn't do any substantial action about that, but he, in many ways, and this is, again, not to really defend a lot of what the Trump administration did, but in many ways, he made their lives a living hell. Which, in the end, at least for me, I don't expect all of you to agree with this. I can completely understand if you disagree with this made Trump all worth it, just, again, backtracking yeah. to that yeah. a bit. Whereas, now that they've got the um, biggest, one of their biggest supporters, so to speak, Biden, this literal swamp creature for all these years, and right. now that he's, he's there, it's, again, it's time to implement their final plan because they know they have screwed themselves so much that what else is there to do than, of course, get, get what you can out out of what's left, you know, pick, you know, pick whatever white meat is left, so to speak. Right. I mean, the, the U S is even downsizing the Marines. Um, that's a, you know, that's a force, a prestigious American force, particularly for like crack units for invasions. Um, yeah, I, you know, it, you don't get one is hesitant to say what's going to happen because it, you know uh, you don't know who's going to call the shot you don't know if the 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 lack of faith in leadership is so endemic right now that um, you know somebody might disobey Biden or it, it's hard to say i know in the in peril, the book that we were discussing with um, the Milley revelations, uh, apparently Blinken and others were trying to convince Biden not to do a rapid pullout and maybe not do a pullout at all. So, you know, Biden went for this. This th- this was Biden's. And uh, he keeps trying to make it seem like, well, you know, we inherited a deal, but we didn't inherit a plan. Well, I mean, really? They're supposed to give you a plan, too? Uh, that, that was preposterous, right? So, yeah, what, what happens next in America? Um, optically, this looks horrible. I think the only... It, it, it's kind of like we, we said this back in 2019. I think it was around the time of the second impeachment on Trump. Uh, you know, I said, for people that aren't 
absolutely invested in either side of, you know, America and who, you know, the, the cultural struggle there. Um, for many countries on the sidelines that are not part of the West, and I consider Russia in many ways not part of the West, they're looking at this and they're, they're wondering, like, what the hell is going on? Like, optically, it was worse to get rid of Trump than to put up with four more years. Well, it does make us wonder about my countries opinion, within the opinion. West. Like, I mean, we got a German election coming up here in 11, 10 days by the time you guys are going to watch this. And we'll see how their attitudes are like that. Because Germany, under both Trump and now Biden, have been pretty staunch in just rebuking the American empire in general. Now, that is mainly taken in the form of Nord Stream 2, the pipeline, of course. But you're, you're seeing, as we discussed previous on previous episodes, this real parting of ways between America and Europe, and something that had been happening since the early 2000s, since I would say the Iraq War, was tempered by the Obama years, picked up again under the Trump years, and then I do think that you could argue the disappointment of Biden did far more to drive them apart than the continuous presence of Trump, because Trump wasn't expected to be this uh, bridge builder, so to speak. He wasn't expected to be this one who uh, connects this gap and brings Europe and the U.S. Back together. In fact, his rhetoric was very antagonistic a lot towards a lot of our so-called allies, particularly in the area of trade, which trade is... Um, lopsided trade deals, as you know, is what built the American Empire post-World War II. That's how we secured the blocks we had. We we're going to give you a really good deal. Uh, you, you have to give us very little, if anything, in return. That only ramped up after the 90s with things like NAFTA and a lot of the other agreements we got into there, and was about to meet its, I would say, it was about to take on a whole new level with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Trump pulled out of in terms of American cooperation with our quote-unquote allies, and this, we're, where we're at now. And of course, the narrative spun to these European people and to these even European governments was, well, you know, Biden's going to be returned to the Obama era. He's going to be returned to the normal policy that Democrats have towards Europe. And it was anything but. They realized he was a massive disappointment. They realized he was nothing like they were expecting yeah. in the slightest. And coming down to Nord Stream 2, in which case, I'm sure there were some people in Europe who had that sort of foresight, but I guess not, even though we can always reference the maps that Germany and France were poised to uh, seek other routes moving forward, regardless of whether or not Trump was in office. I don't have the maps on me right now, as I'm sure many of you will be disappointed, but you'll remember in that one map... Most of Europe was pink under Trump, and still mo plenty of the major players in Europe were pink under a non-Trump president. Now, of course, those were projections based on what these governments have said and done under the Trump administration, but I'm curious, I can't remember what institute put that out, if they put out an update map showing the projection of these countries, because I bet even more of the map is pink with a Biden presidency. And come to think of it, I can't really think of anyone in the sphere of American politics, anyone who is of president material, so to speak, anyone who has a realistic chance of taking the office either from Biden or from a Republican side in 2024, because I don't see Kamala being a good diplomat towards Europe. I don't see um, right. uh, some uh, Blinken remaining in the administration. I don't see anyone in the Republicans. I mean, there is no real leader of the Republican Party that still sort of falls on Trump. And not to mention beyond the American side, just the changes in Europe. There is seemingly, with Nord Stream 2, I'm not saying it's dissipated entirely, less of a fear of Russia. A lot of the outrage about Ukraine and Crimea and Syria has died down. Their main concerns at the moment seem to be, well, what is the European Union policy towards this whole COVID thing going to be? Um, the economic instability of various European countries the impending French and German elections, and is Turkey going to try to send more migrants in again? And all that being said, I think their bilateral relations with America, it's not like that's something they're completely unconcerned with, but I do think, much like us, the Europeans are much more concerned about what's happening at home and in their backyards than what's happening across the Atlantic Ocean. 
Right. And to that, uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, gave a, an address today in EU Parliament. And we've been following this uh, again for the EU to form its own military, probably overlapping and coordinating with NATO, but definitely its own military. And funny how the case for it now is so much stronger than basically what Merkel and Macron were talking about a year ago. It seems almost like, like an inevitability, and I think pulling out of Afghanistan is absolutely the, the main culprit for this, uh, for accelerating these talks. They probably could have been pushed back another six months had the pullout happened successfully, but they can't now. And it's, 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 it's really now uh, back on the boilerplate. And um, or off the boat, sorry. So it's, um, it's front and center. And, you know, just, uh, what you were saying a little earlier about Trump, you know, I think the reaction to Trump, a lot of it, you know, has to be understood that this, there's been a 70, 75 year period in Western history, uh, beginning with works like Adorno's, um, you know, the authoritarian personality and, Habermas uh, discussing what should happen to Germany so that, you know, there'll never be another Nazi or nationalist uprising ever again. And to do that, you know, of course, everybody understands the importance of migrants, but uh, the importance of female power and female, basically female value systems had to be adopted. And and after that, of course, if, if you're going to do that, then, of course, uh, uh, you know, gay empowerment and, and, and gay liberation was also inevitable. And, and then combine is, the two and get trans rights. <laughs> right. And so this has gone on for so long that anything remotely like uh, any political opinions, even from Obama's first term, uh, just to let you know how, thing, how rapidly things have changed. Uh, so just eight years or seven years after that, it, it was difficult. And then just 10 years after that, it was just unthinkable for people. And, you know, well, let's say a huge swath of, of influential people. Um, that's how much they had moved along this line. That's what became, you know, what has defined the West. But now you're seeing, as we've been pointing out, uh, fractures beginning to take place. I was watching France 24, and again, the concern for uh, another wave of migrants. Um, it's possible that if we have another wave of migrants, we'll have another Brexit. Uh, it'll be a different EU country. We can't afford to do this. So the talk is very different now. I think the migrant crisis of 2015 and 16, um, yes, there is probably some lip service that's just there to tap down on any kind of populist uh, uh, sentiments to lull them into security. However, I do think that at this moment and probably for the near future, they are deeply afraid of um, uh, another wave like the kind that we saw in 2015 and 16. At least until after the French election, I would say, because, and I would say the French is much more pivotal than the German is backwards as that might sound, because yeah. you'll remember that letter put out by the 20 retired French military officers and just laying out the state of instability there, the past almost three years of protest at this point, on and off, of course, yeah. starting with the Yellow Vests in late 2018. There is much more potential for, as I said, not necessarily a civil war, but complete civil unrest, therefore, any hope of at least concessions from the regime. And you saw Macron pay lip service to a lot of those post- Yellow Vest post-protests. Funny enough, those actually shut down last year by the outbreak and the lockdowns and all that kind of stuff. It really makes you think, but I suppose that's beside <laughs> the point. But, I mean, not only is France the only concern there, but I'm, I'm ta we're talking probably continent-wide. You saw unrest in Italy recently, not that they're famed for their political stability, even though they are still, at this point, the third largest economy in the European Union, as much as a basket case as they may be. Uh, yeah. the, the Eastern Front, Hungary and Poland, even though Poland more or less capitulated, have been unruly, to say the least. You have the lingering Russia question, which it seems like they want to take a one-foot-in, one-foot-out approach with. 
and the economic the impending economic crises of southern Europe. I mean, the, or should I say the ongoing economic crisis of southern Europe, with places like Spain and Greece and you know, again Italy with their unemployment rate, with their youth unemployment rate. I, I mean, the social fabric of Europe, I would argue, um, in many countries, is still stronger than that of the U.S., which is why I think there is some opportun- more opportunity for several European countries to, quote-unquote, fix themselves before the United States ever will. But it's still an unstable time there, but I feel much more optimistic, I would say, just looking at this, from my point of view at least, about the future of many European countries compared to the future of the United States, Canada, the, the Anglosphere in general. I would say maybe France is on that level, but again, my yeah. opinion has always gone back and forth on the stability of France, so to speak. But I do think the other angle that, again, a lot of people have overlooked throughout all these crises, and again, I don't blame them, there's a lot happening internally where you don't really have the time to look externally, is how much of a similar paradigm the rest of the world is currently experiencing. And that we're really on the brink of change. And some of those far-fetched predictions I would make in 2019 about the rapid decline of the American empire, when I made those predictions, again, they were offhand. I was talking like 2025 to 2029. But no, we're in late 2021. We're in the last third of the year. It's September of 2021, about halfway through. And we're looking at a lot of things I didn't expect to happen for another three and a half or, you know, four years at this point. Yeah, it, it, it's it's so fast, really. Um, I, I, I didn't either, but, you know, I guess, I guess uh, we're learning because, um, how can I put it? Um, sometimes when you have these, I guess, you know, maybe we, we under, you know, I'll speak for myself. Uh, I underplayed, I think, what an effect I, uh, that the micro crisis played on on politics in in Europe, and you know, it wasn't my first thought watching what was happening in Afghanistan, for instance, that the EU would be pushing so hard for its own EU army. This is obviously a lot uh, a loss of faith in uh, you know in America, and and I understand the the counter arguments like the Europeans have had it really good. Uh, but in a way, you could argue that they're they're saying we're going to pay for this, and that lessens the burden for the U.S. as well. But in any case, it's not the first thing that I thought of. So um, I feel like in, in the back of my head, um, there's still that feeling like um, you know, for lack of a better term, global homo is undefeatable. You can, you cannot you cannot defeat it. It's it's too powerful. It's too strong. It's never. It can never be weakened, and on and on and on. But the, the the truth is, is it can, and we are seeing hemorrhaging of this um, of this empire uh, right now in in very big ways, and that's causing all its partners and some of even of its vassal states to behave very differently, and they are as unsure as you said as they were when. Uh, uh, the you know when Trump was running for election. So, oh certainly. And with that being said, that is uh, all I had for this episode. At least, unless you have any last minute uh, items. No, that, that's that's all I have as well. Okay, and. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in to this uh, very interesting episode of The War Report. We're finally... I know we had a couple of special episodes that didn't exactly cover recent events, uh, but you guys seem to enjoy them. Uh, welcome to any new viewers who may have come as a result of those two, and I hope you enjoy the content, I hope you stick around, and we will see you guys next time, and goodbye. Take care, guys.